All good now? Perfect. So we'll go back <laughs> to where we started. So microservices in .NET. My name is Nesh. I work on the .NET team. I'm a PM. Uh, I work specifically on the architecture reference guides uh, and cloud native apps. So if you haven't checked this website called .NET slash architecture, I encourage you to go check that out because we have a bunch of resources out there for you to get started uh, with microservices, cloud native. If you're migrating from uh, your existing monolith to uh, you know modern cloud native apps, or if you have uh, scenarios where you're porting a web forms application to Blazor, you have scenarios where you want to move from WCF to gRPC, there are a bunch of resources out there. We work with a lot of customers, understand how .NET is used in production, and we write these guidances based on those feedbacks. So you have all these things for you uh, to grab it for free. So I will, as part of this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, this session, I will show you where to grab or grab all this information, and I'll also show you how to get started with microservices from scratch. Right. Um, so let's get started. What are microservices? Well, microservices, um, you know generally referenced as microservices architecture. It states that the app is structured as a collection of smaller services. Um, most importantly, they, they focus on a specific business uh, and they are defined by uh, bound, uh, bo business boundaries and a bounded context. And they are independently deployable. They are loosely coupled. And uh, most importantly, they are, uh, they, are, they are focused by smaller teams. And that is the uh, in autonomy the, uh, the microservices get so that you, know, you can iterate quickly. So there's some business requirement for a particular service uh, to add a feature. They don't have to depend on other services. Uh, you can actually ship it to production within no time so you iterate faster right and another thing about uh, you know resource utilization when it comes to uh, servers is the if you look at uh, monolithic applications generally we have these layers of web uh, server uh, there's a UI layer. There's probably a data access layer. They're all actually, you know, packaged into a deployable unit, and then they are scaled into the VMs. So uh, you, whenever you want to scale up, you basically, you know, spin up multiple VMs. You probably have a load balancer in front, which is kind of like taking the traffic, looking at the traffic, and and diverting those uh, things to particular VMs. Uh, but in microservices, because they are really small and they're very focused in nature, uh, they don't have to re really understand which what. Uh, VMs it needs to run on or or any of that sort because they are loosely coupled. So it can be actually scaled across multiple VMs or it, when you scale, you can scale it within VM or it can be scaled across with VMs, right? It doesn't because they are independent. Um, so you get those advantages as well. Um, now talking about monolithic applications, is it bad? I mean, this is a common question people get. Uh, people ask us, like, you know, should I just convert everything to microservice? So I'm starting new. Should I start with microservice services? Absolutely not. Uh, you know. Many successful apps that exist today were created as monoliths, so you don't have to move if, if you if if there is no need for you to move. For example, there are certain criteria where you look look at. For example, if you have a larger team and you are able to have smaller teams fo focus groups out of it, and if you're able to define boundaries correctly and uh, 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 and and provide infrastructure for that, then it makes sense. But if you're a smaller team, you want to be have having a perfect focus, uh, you still can go with monolith applications. Absolutely, no need to migrate. This is not not old versus new. This is just an architectural choice that you're making uh, when you're building application. And a lot of people actually start monolith uh, if they're starting small and eventually migrate to microservices when it is absolutely necessary for their teams to adopt that. All right, talking about microservices architecture, and uh, this is the, the kind of architecture that you see here is just a reference sample uh, called eShop and containers. Uh, we took the e-commerce application as to show as a reference sample because it's easy to understand. Um, that's that's the only uh, reason, but it could be any application that you want to build. It can take adopt this architecture. Uh, if you look at this on your right side, you have multiple services, identity microservice, catalog microservice, ordering microservice, right? They're immediately, you can understand they're defined by a bounded context, and they specifically focus on their scenarios. Now, uh, one thing you probably would have noticed is like in the, in the previous slide, when I go back, uh, if you look at the monolith world, uh, you probably would split up into modules, uh, and you may have still have services which are APIs, uh, but then there is always a bottleneck of relational database. So, for example, um, if you, uh, I mean, in this case, relational database, it could be any other database for that, for uh, example, right? So. Uh, if you want to change something in, let's say, in catalog, as an uh, and if it has relational tables that is referencing, you may have to even update the schema of the other tables too, right? Um, so situ situation can happen because the dependency is very high, and that is where the bottleneck happens. So you have to really wait for a uh, lot of tests and a lot of integration tests to be completed before you can actually ship uh, this in uh, production. 
Now, when it comes to API, uh, sorry, when it comes to Microsoft architecture, you can immediately see the database itself is separated. So every service owns its own database, and that is the key point, and that is what helps the scale, right? Uh, the so no two applications can actually go and uh, no two services can actually go and reference another databases. It can only communicate with a specific contract or an API endpoint, usually done as a HTTP or gRPC. Um, or so in, in many cases, there are also asynchronous communications that are preferred. Uh, for example, you have an ordering microservice, and it has completed one of the order creation. And it can just raise an event saying, OK, order, order created. And the payment service can actually look at that order based on the event that was published by ordering microservice. So, you know. Ordering doesn't have to know that payment needs to do the next thing. The payment just, you know, subscribes to this event and acts uh, uh, accordingly. So that way, you really don't have dependencies on other services. And uh, the, the way you implement event buses, there are many ways. I mean, RabbitMQ is just one example. In productions, you probably want to use Azure Service Bus, or if you go to the cloud, you want to use some of the other things. It's, it's, a, it's again, a choice that you can make. Uh, and similarly, when you have service-to-service -service communications, uh, for example, when, a, when there is a web client and it needs to connect directly to these services, all these services doesn't have to expose itself outside. It can go through something like an API gateway and implement a backend for front-end pattern uh, so that you know only certain um, you know, APIs are accessible to this client, and the the API gateway can kind of decide what services to be called in, and they become the uh, point where you can't want to control the security as well. For example, uh, simple example is HTTPS, right? You can actually terminate HTTPS at the API gateway itself, so the you know uh, internal communication between the microservices can be HTTP for faster uh, reasons, and and these these kind of choices can be made. Another another important thing is like if you look at the coupon microservice right there, it uses MongoDB, right? Baskets uses the Redis cache. So you also have the technology choice. So if you're a small team, you're focusing on the technology for whatever makes it work for your business, you can also choose the technology as well, um, right? So there, there are a number of things out there, and this is all detailed in the book, but I will briefly touch upon a few things uh, today. Talking about what are containers, right? Uh, if you look at traditionally how you deploy application is you have a VM, um, and that's where you package your app and your binaries and host it into the VM. The VM will have a guest OS. And when you want to scale up, you have you scale up these uh, multiple VMs. Uh, containers, on the other hand, basically have your app binaries and also the operating system dependencies packaged into a small image, uh, which can be run on containers, right? So that way, it is, it is loosely coupled. It is immutable in nature. Um, so you can actually ship multiple images if you want to. You can have multiple versions of uh, your uh, services and make your API gateway make the choice. Do you want to direct it to a new service, or do you want to go back to an older version of the service and other things? Right? You get a bunch of um, uh, advantage with containers. Now, the other important thing is like, once you package the image, you also save the operating system layer that it depends on. So that way, you really don't have to worry about if your VM has these drivers installed or not. You, you just package into image. If it works on a dev system, it will work on a test system, integration system, and eventually to the production as well. And that is a great advantage that we have. Now, uh, do we need do we need containers for microservices? Uh, absolutely not. And I mean, this is always debated. Like, you know, whenever people talk about microservices, they talk with containers. The reason is containers definitely gives that benefit of making it smaller, packaging it all together, and it gives you a lot more uh, advantages. And that's why they, that is spoken together. But you can have microservice architecture. Again, that's a design pattern. You can implement it without containers. And the other way also works. For example, if you have a monolith application and uh, you want to containerize it, you can do that. And a lot of people do that. Like they do, they start with taking their existing application from their uh, uh, you know, infrastructure, take it to the cloud in a VM, and then eventually containerize it because they want to make use of this Kubernetes and orchestration engine. Uh, they kind of like you know, uh, package them into containers, but that does not mean that is microservices, right? Microservices is an architectural design pattern, uh, which we'll go into it a little bit later. All right, uh, talking about traditional virtualized environment, this is what I was talking about. There is a hardware host operating system. There's a hypervisor. Just uh, it makes the guest always uh, respond to these uh, apps and other things. And uh, it could literally be like some apps may need some resources. Some apps really literally do not need uh, resources. So for exa example, if you go with a containerized technology, uh, in this case, we're saying Docker engine, but it could be Kubernetes, or Kubernetes orchestrator as well. Like you know, It can kind of decide, if I don't need that kind of infrastructure, I can bring my VM down. And uh, it just helps you save a lot of cost. What we see is by 2022, more than 75% of the global organization will be running containerized application in production. What is the reason for that? The main reason for that is the Kubernetes, right? Which is a uh, community supported open source project. And the big benefit of Kubernetes is vendor neutral, right? Every cloud provider provides its own 
flavors of it, but then it, it still is Kubernetes. So uh, it is vendor neutral, so you can scale um, uh, across uh, the cloud. You can also host it maybe uh, within your hi uh, hybrid infrastructure or even, even in the private uh, cloud for that matter. Uh, and it's also used today in production by all these amazing companies like Spotify, SAP, eBay, all these guys use it. So. Um, so it's it's a proven technology, and if you're getting started with microservices today, you might as well look at Kubernetes for that matter. All right, so sometimes it may be intimidating to get started with all these things, and that is why we have a bunch of resources to get you started with, and they're all free. Uh, go to this website called dot dot net slash architecture, and uh, um, you know feel free to grab uh, all the resources out there. They're all free. They're all updated. They're kept relevant. And if you have a feedback on this, I'm the guy. You have to let me know that this is something which we are looking for. We didn't find it here, or this is something we have implemented, and we would love to have this in your book. Um, you know, contact me, and I would be uh, happy to take uh, those feedback in. All right. So with that in, I want to focus more on the demos, and depending on the time that we have, uh, I want to build a microservice from scratch. Uh, just to show you how, what are the things that you would use today for building a containerized application using .NET and Docker tools. We'll also expose some of the Visual Studio tools that is available for Docker. Uh, we will, I will show you some of the free learning resources. So if you want to get started with Docker and uh, uh, Kubernetes, you can go step by step. Yeah, you know there are resources where you can just go hands on within an hour's time. So we have those bunch of resources which are totally free, and I'll show you how to get started with there. And also. Which is very exciting, Project Thai, uh, which is this is from our team, and we want to make easy uh, development of, of .NET when it comes to microservices. So we want to give you a tool that is more like an orchestrator, but for the developer scenarios than uh, than uh, that is going to be used in production. So you will see some of those things. These are preview features, but you can check that out. And uh, we're hitting full gas to add more and more features to the Project Thai, and we will see some of those things uh, in a demo. All right, let's let's uh, let's go to the demo. So this is my screen. Um, number of ways to get started with .NET. Um, the one way that I like it so much now is basically starting with the command line, right? So I can do a .NET new, and these are basically the templates out there. So if you're starting with a console application, you can start with console application. And uh, this is one of the things about .NET, right? It gives you those templates to get you started. So you don't have to write a lot of things from scratch. So in my case, since it's a microservices, let's stick to something like an API. So I'm going to use something .NET web new web API. Three fingers today, uh, managing too many things at one side. So all right. So I'm just going to say I want to uh, use something like hello microservice. That's the name of the directory that I want to give. I uh, just want to make sure I'm spelling it right. Hello, microservice. All right. So this is going to create this uh, application. And if you look at, basically, it has this hello, microservices directory, and we'll navigate into that. And then I can just open this up um, in Visual Studio Code. So there you go. So I have this program.cs and startup.cs, which will set everything up for you, me to just run an API. And for this, so it'll ask me, do you want to add C Sharp extensions? Yes, of course. Um, um, and this will help me, you know, run this application. So if I want to run this, I can go into the run and say, okay, go ahead, run this application. So as it runs, you can see my terminal window, and it just started on one of the other tabs. So here you go. So if you look at localhost 5001, uh, there's absolutely nothing on this page, right? So if I want to see what exactly it has is basically I have to navigate to weather forecast because that is the uh, code that it gets defaultly generated. For example, if you go into the controllers, there's a weather forecast controller. Let me push this down a little bit. And it has these uh, basically some random values. So every time you just hit it, it is going to send you some random values and put these things here, right? It's a very simple thing. Now let's, let's add something to this. Now, the first thing I want to add is basically I want to know where exactly this, this application is running. And for that, I can simply go ahead and uh, be magic of again ASP.NET uh, with all the dependency injection. I have the logger also there. So I'm just going to say logger dot uh, log information. Logging is very useful for microservices. So remember that. Um, so I'm going to say environment dot OS, I think it's OS version, uh, and I'll just use the version string. So this is basically goes, in this case, it's going to be console. It's going to just log it into the console, saying, where am I running this up in uh, uh, the thing, right? So let that be there. And then let's go add something like Swagger. Now, um, 
Swagger is basically helps you kind of like you, you saw how I was going navigating to the weather forecast to know what is the services available. Uh, Swagger can add this definition uh, by itself, right? So I can just go and say add um, the NuGet package, which is responsible for this. Splash buckle uh, dot, I think I'm writing it right. It's been at core. Let's see. Okay. The add package, I think. <clears throat> there you go. So it's going to add this watch buckle. And if you want to see what it did, did is basically it just goes and adds into the CS project. This is where this I can just type this in here. But I just wanted to show you how to do that in .NET uh, tool CLI. All right, that's done now. So now there are a few other things that I need to take care of. For example, I need to uh, add my dependency injection and also add the middleware that is necessary to run this. So let's say services dot add uh, swagger gen uh, to this. Just one line of code. And I'll also just copy uh, another line of code that I already have written it here just to make it easier. Um, so, okay, let me just go and say app dot use. Okay, there you go. And one more line of information um, called UI up and running. And so this is by default, this is the endpoint that it's going to point to where the swagger is um, uh, going to show these uh, available APIs for us. But I can just go and say root prefix in this case to be string but empty so that, you know, by default, the uh, page that comes up in the swagger page itself. All right. So then I go back and just say, okay, now run this thing and it's going to run it again. And again, it opens on the, the screen. So let me just bring that back and it oops. Okay, there you go. So now I have this swagger. So you can see that by, by default, the index.html gives you. And also it gives you like, you know, what are the available APIs for you to work with? So just a few lines of code and we're ready to go. Um, so I'm just going to get, uh, click on get and there's something called a stride out um, and click on the execute. Uh, so this is basically going to give the same things that we, use, we saw already with the weather forecast. But the important information that I'm looking for is where exactly is this running, right? So uh, if I go back to VS Code, and if you look at my logs uh, here, so there you go. So it's running on Windows NT 10.0.1904. So it just tells me, okay, this is running. This is a .NET application running on Windows. No big deal, right? Now let's take this to the next level. Let's take this to the Docker. So if I want to containerize this application, all that in VS Code, this is another beautiful tool. Uh, Control Shift P and say add Docker files to this workspace. As I do it, I want to show you the Solution Explorer. Um, so add Docker files to the workspace. Uh, it'll ask you what platform this is. Obviously, there's a .NET code, so you just say .NET. Um, and you can choose if you want to build a Windows container or a Linux container. In my case, I'm interested in the Linux container. Um, does it require Docker Compose files? Apps not required because we may use uh, Kubernetes for orchestrations. So I'll just remove that, and it'll ask me for the default ports. That's it. What it does is it basically goes ahead and adds this Docker file to our application, which is pretty cool, right? Um, all that it needs is basically, okay, what is my underlying image that I need to rely on? In this case, I'm using the .NET 5 preview, so it's using the ASP.NET 5.0. Um, and it also, uh, we can also bring in the SDK so that we can copy all these files from the local, put it into the Docker container, compile it right there, and then uh, you know publish it. Uh, so the advantage that you get is basically you have this entry point and your app will be called whenever you want to run the service. You're basically going to call .NET hello microservice.tll and it's going to bring up your application. That's it, right? So in in Visual Studio Code, I can just go ahead and instead of choosing the .NET Core launch now, I want to run on Docker. So I'm just going to say Docker .NET Core launch. And here's another beautiful thing. Uh, about VS Code is that, or, or if you're using Visual Studio, you can actually debug these things directly. So I can just put a breakpoint here, or maybe here, and then run this, right? So let's run this. Um, while that is running, I'll quickly... Okay. So I keep getting this UI onto the side, so that's okay. Um, get weather forecast, try it out, click on execute. And you see that you know my VS code is saying, oh, hey, you need to debug this. So now if you look at the version string, and as I go into the details, it's basically Unix 4.19.104. So basically, we just took a .NET app, containerized it, 
and now it's all running on Linux. This is the beauty, right? .NET works everywhere. Um, so you can go ahead and debug this. Um, that's good enough for me now. So now let's take this to the next world, which is the Kubernetes. Now that you have created this Docker, you have these images ready, you want to go and uh, uh, you know publish this. So for example, um, in my case, uh, since I was running uh, Visual Studio, it probably would have created something like a dev tag for it to run. But if I want to you know, compile this myself uh, into a Docker image, uh, I can just go ahead and use this uh, Docker uh, build, uh, my mouse, get me back my mouse. Okay, build uh, the context that where it is and then where the Docker file is and then provide the tag. And I can just say, hello, microservice. Uh, and I can say, this is my latest version. Uh, so this is what I want to publish it. So I want to rebuild it. So now I can see that, you know, it just goes ahead and does the same thing what VS Code was doing. Uh, but now I'm actually compiling as the latest tag, not the dev tag. So now I have the image ready. Um, now, how do I let this go into the Kubernetes world, which is the orchestrator, right? Uh, to do that, um, you know, you need something called as container registry. Now, Predominantly, if you want to build and deploy applications uh, in VMs, you probably have a FTP site open. You will copy those files into that, or you will have a VM site open and you will install something into that. But now, when it comes to Kubernetes and things, it needs uh, some place to pull the image. Now that it's packaged into image, it's immutable, and it's just going to work the same way how it works everywhere else, right? So um, for that, what you need to do is there's one more step that you need to do is basically you have to go and tag it uh, with your, uh, I'm not typing this correctly, but you basically say, your your um i think it's this latest and then say what do i want to tag it as now i'm using niche channel and i can call this as anything uh, the the idea about this one um, is this is your container registry so by default if you just give your username it basically provides you it thinks uh, it, it assumes that you are using the docker hub so in my case i have this thing already on my docker hub because i pushed this earlier so if we go back to the hub.docker.com, this is my login, and this is the this is the username that is needed for container registry. Um, so I have these things. So I have these hello microservices, which was published on four days ago. It's pretty much the same code that you saw right now, um, and I can technically pull this image. So it's already there in the. Uh, container registry. So I just need to make a pull. So now I need Kubernetes, right? So I have Kubernetes running on my machine. So I'm using this Docker. And this is beautiful. Um, in DOS, and just let me go, just kind of pick Docker. So a lot of people can use, uh, are using MiniQ, which is good. Uh, but I'm just going to use Kubernetes that came with the Docker. It just works. Um, and uh, uh, it also uses WSL2. I mean, if you used Docker in the past, uh, you probably have to go and set the VM. Like, you know, I want four gigs and, and uh, I need so much of resources and I think that's all gone with WSL because now WSL2 in Windows, there's a Linux baked in, uh, the kernel baked in. So basically when you say WSL2, it's going to use the same kernel and it's going to run on it. So that's the beauty. Uh, so I love that. Um, and, and because I have that, uh, all that I need to do is I say kubectl and get parts right now i'm just going to see uh what are the uh so the context is set to basically the docker desktop and i'm just seeing what are the things this is running uh these are for my later demos so i'm just leave it, going to leave it there there's absolutely no hello microservice running that's what i want to show you um so i want to i want to run that right i want to deploy that so i need to provide a deployment file for it so i go back to my um if I go back to my visual studio code and i'm going to create a new file called uh Deploy dot. I mean, you can call this anything. Uh, in in production, you may not be doing this way. You probably will have a YAML scripted into some kind of DevOps, uh, or you may use Helm for that matter. So, but just let's keep it simple for learning purposes, right? So I have this um, uh, config file already. So I'm going to just go and paste that here. So basically, it just says. Uh, hey, uh, Kubernetes, we have a deployment that needs to be taken care of. And the important thing about this thing is you need to get this image from this hello microservice latest, and that's what we need it, right? So it has nothing to do with the code here. It basically is just referencing the container registry and it's just pulling that image from there. And the good thing about um, you know environment files is like, you know, uh, there are some convention that you need to follow, but you can actually send in all these configuration settings as well. This is for your .NET application to pick it up and start working on. For example, I'm setting the environment variable. So if you don't just give development, it's going to run it on production. So I'm just reconfiguring it so that I get more lo log information and other things, right? So I have this deployment file. This is good enough for me. Now, look at this. What I'm going to do is Control Shift P again. And this time I'm saying Kubernetes. And I'm going to say, OK, go and create this cluster for me. And I say, create. So this goes and actually goes in, look at, looks at this, and says, OK, 
uh, this microservice is created. Now let's go back to the uh, Kubernetes um, and just go to kubectl get service. There you go, there's a hello microservice running. And this is of type load balancer. This is again for local testing purpose. So load balancer is the type that you use uh, so that if you want an IP um, that can be accessed from outside, right? So in this case, um, so right now, if you just go in and say kubectl and get pods, just to make sure the pods are running. There you go. So the hello microservice is running. Remember, we just set the port as 80. So now if I just go into my um, hello microservice here, oops, sorry, localhost, and do not, oops, 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 battery fingers, um, localhost, and no 5107, and there you go. So it's the same app. It just pulled in and it's running right inside the Kubernetes, right? So now we can just go and say, try it out and say, click execute. Now, if I go back to my Kubernetes, I just want to look at the log file, right? I just, because I compile it on Unix, I want to make sure that is what it's running on. So I can just say kubectl uh, and uh, logs of, I just want to get the logs of this hello microservice. I'm just going to copy this part and put that in. And you can see that uh, when it was running, it also runs on the same uh, image that we copied in. And this is the beauty of this, right? So whatever you compile in, all the operating system dependencies, they're all going and um, you know uh, deployed into Kubernetes. Pretty good. All right. Um, just quick check on the time. Um, OK. So we just took this uh, and uploaded it uh, into Kubernetes. But uh, let me show you some resources to get you started. So for example, if you're starting for the first time, you didn't figure this thing out yourself. You want to get started from scratch. There are great resources. For example, you can just go to the site called dot dot net. That's what you need. And once you go there, um, you will have this section called microservices. Click on that. And the moment you go into the microservices, it will obviously tell you a lot of things. There are some videos that you can try, uh, check it out with Docker. Uh, but I want you to try this out because it's called Get Started. If you go there, now this will guide you through the entire process of, you know, uh, maybe you're starting with .NET for the first time, right? Installing the .NET, creating the service, all that I showed you right now, this is all baked in. So you can choose if you're working on Mac OS, there are steps for Mac OS, Linux. And by end of it, uh, you know, you also have this step called, you know, deploy to Azure. So if you, right now, what I did is I took the uh, deployment and deployed directly to the Kubernetes that is running locally, uh, but you can go ahead and deploy to any Kubernetes. So in this case, AKS. So if you want to go and build it for AKS, what is the Azure resources that you're going to do? Uh, there are a few steps that you want to, uh, and everything is in command line. So you can just get started with that, right? Now, this is all getting started, and this is uh, this is the easy part about microservices. In reality, microservices are much, much, much complex than that, and that's why uh, you probably need more documentation, more context, and more understanding of how this needs to be done. So if you go to the same site .NET, and then this is this tab called Architecture, and this is what I PM about PM on, and so I am very proud of these uh, documents out there. This really amazing content that you should check out. So here you can get started with microservices, right? So there are a bunch of books that you can start downloading and read right away, or you can just go to microservices. And then if you want to see how this is done in production, you want a production scale application, um, you know, get started with something called eShop and containers, right? Explore the sample on GitHub. Basically, it takes you to this .NET architecture repo. And you can look at this. This is the this is the entire code out here. Now, this is a microservices reference application. It's a very fairly simple application. I'll just execute this and show you right now. Uh, but the important aspect of this is, you know, they all are independent services. Now, you know, a lot of people argue that you know it is an anti-pattern to have a single repository for a microservice and all putting all together all the microservices together. Uh, we do that for the reason that you know it becomes easy for you to get started. But the CI and CD pipelines for each individual microservices is different, and that is that is possible because Azure DevOps gives you the trigger. Like if you just go and change code in one of those subdirectories, I can just execute that pipeline. So that's how we have done it. So it's still multiple microservices running. Okay. Um, so let's let's uh, what you do is basically you can go to this site and just click on code and then say clone this uh, locally. Once you have that locally, let's go shift gears now. So this is my eShop and containers. I, if I just list all the things here, uh, you'll see something called a source code. Uh, if I navigate to the source code, and you will have a lot of things. So let me open that again in Visual Studio Code. Uh, 
Uh, they go, uh, none of this is um, uh, you know important right now. We don't have to look at all of these things because it's complex for a reason, because they're microservices, they're split into uh, multiple uh, you know business uh, functionalities and they work with each other either through a service uh, you know endpoints or uh, you know the uh, MQ. So we have so many things out there. Now, uh, if you go into services, this is where all the stuffs are there. Uh, all the services are there. So I'll just ignore this. What I generally do is um, I will go and look at the code that is most relevant for me. Uh, in my case, I want to first run this. So all that I need to do is as long as Docker is running, um, you just take care of um, you know, writing this command correctly, docker-compose, and say up. And this is going to create all the images out there. So remember, um, you know, all these images were compiled earlier. Um, so you can do a Docker build to compile everything, Docker compose build. It'll it'll go and build everything for you. But in this case, I'm just saying up. So basically, it's going to run this application. And right now, you can see that there are a bunch of microservices here, and they're all uh, logging all this information. And that's what is coming into the terminal. Um, the first thing that you want to do right now, once it is run, is not basically go to the main site, but look at something like um, 5107 port. This is where we implement health check. And this is a key feature. When it comes to microservices, uh, because there are multiple services, you need to know if that service is healthy so that you can drive traffic to that, right? So we implement health check. And .NET has this built-in feature for adding health checks. And we also use this NuGet package called um, Thing ASP.NET Code Diagnostics Health Check, which actually adds a uh, beautiful UI. And it also gives you those checks that you can do. For example, your service has some dependency, like a database or Mongo. So if you want to connect to Mongo and see if this that de dependency is working fine, uh, you can write those health checks. So if you use this NuGet package, you, it's already written for you. So you just add it, and then this works. Now, the other thing about health check is there is an important aspect called in Kubernetes called liveness and readiness probes, um, what liveness probe does is basically Kubernetes is going to ping your application time to time. You basically write that in your configuration saying, this is my URL to ping. And Kubernetes goes and pings uh, every few seconds to see if you are good. And for some reason, if you don't send it, uh, send a status code, which is successful status codes like 200, um, it will go ahead and re restart your service. And that's what Kubernetes is, is good for because you don't have to, you know, you don't have a human to go and look for these things. It will, as long as your service is good, it will be, it will no, do nothing. But for some reason, you're not able to send status code 200 for, it can be crash, it can be hang. It'll go and restart this uh, service for you. So that's why it's important to specify that. Now there's another probe called readiness probe. Uh, which is what you would generally use if you want to go and um, uh, you know deploy. Uh, sorry, if you want to if you want Kubernetes to drive traffic to that, right? Uh, so you may be healthy, uh, but then you also want the dependencies to come up. So your readiness probe can actually you know say, okay, don't send traffic now. So until you say true. Uh, the Kubernetes will not drive traffic to. So this is why these health checks are important. We have this nice UI dashboard. So if you look at basket, uh, it all depends on a Redis. So it also makes those checks and nothing. So this is all baked into um, uh, .NET and these NuGet packages help you do that. So once you do that, basically you can go to 5100 um, and then this is a simple app. You click on login. Uh, this is a very advanced e-commerce application, so we don't have to register for any username and password because we just give it to you right away. Uh, so you just have to make sure copy and pasting. We are all developers. We are good at these things. Uh, so you just have to go ahead and do that. Um, click and log in. So now I have the add to cart. I go to the cart, check out, and place order, and there you go. So all good. Uh, it just makes sense. It's really fairly simple, right? Why do we have such a complex code? The reason exists because microservice in microservices we split them, and the idea is individual teams take care of the services, and that's why that complexity exists. And we use a bunch of patterns like CQR, SDDD, and other things. So go check them out. Uh, there are a lot of things that is explained in the wiki. But by the way, if you want to do hands-on this, uh, if you go to this uh, site, uh, Ishaban Containers, there is something which say, "Hey, are you new to microservice and cloud-native development? Just go click on." this thing. So there is this beautiful MS Learn module out there where you can, it will give you step-by-step -step guidance on how to build microservices, right? So in my case, in this case, for example, uh, what we do is like, you know, we looked at like, you know, how, what, how easy could be, how easy can we make to help you build microservices? So we took a scenario, let's say you are for the first time getting into a company where there is already microservice architecture and your job is to add a new functionality. That's a perfect example of to learn microservices, right? So we do that. 
so we explain the solution architectures and other things, but the task that you have in your hand right now here is basically, let me see if I can find that thing. Yeah, basically go ahead and add this discount code uh, into the existing production app. So that's the code that you do. Now, the good thing about MS Learn is the way we have architected this is this is all running inside of, uh, let me go to the right link, uh, running inside of Azure. Uh, so you don't have to set up anything locally. If you have an iPad, for example, uh, have a browser, just go to the browser, have an Azure subscription. And if you don't have it, we also tell you how to get the free subscription. Just sign up for that. And you can you can literally use, it, it doesn't cost much to just start with it. Uh, you can you can try this out yourself. And everything is being deployed in AKS. And you'll also, instead of Docker Hub, you'll be using Azure Container Registry as well. So how do you secure your images as well? So those aspects are covered here. So it's just very straightforward. Um, so I'll share these links um, at the end of it, or I'll share it with the community who will be sharing all these links with you later. Okay, I think we don't have enough time right now. Uh, let's see, quick time check. Okay, we have only five minutes. Let's go and try Thai. Five minutes is not good enough for Thai, but anyway. So you saw this, how uh, it becomes extremely difficult when it when you when you work around with microservices. Uh, but wouldn't it be nice if as a .NET developer, if you hack and if, if you can just run all these things together without really worrying about containers and other things? Uh, so that's what Thai does, right? So for example, if you look at this uh, directory, I have this. Um, let me maximize this. Uh, so I have this backend and frontend. Uh, generally, typically how you write these services. So you have a frontend, you have a backend. So if you want to go and run this application, you go to CD backend and uh, .NET run, and it is going to run the backend. Uh, and if you go to frontend, so let's go to frontend. Um, let's see, uh, and then add .NET run. And there you go, you have the backend and front end running. So you have this port running on finite 01. Uh, you have this port running on finite 03. So this is my front end, this is where I want to see. So if I just control C and uh, go into my browser, uh, look on it, oh, there's an error. What is that error? So it says it's trying to reach weather forecast, but it's not available. And the reason for that is basically you have written a long, hard coded a long string into it, right? So let me uh, go fix that. Uh, let me go back to the terminal. Let's go fix that. So if I just go one step up and do code dot. And basically, if I go into the front end, and if you look at my modified file, okay, I was supposed to not use this, but this was a hard coded string that was supposed to be lying there. But I wanted to show you Thai. So what Thai does is basically, uh, if you just simply, you don't have to do this .NET run multiple times. And instead, if you're on the main folder, you can actually say Thai run. And this will go into your solution and it will go detect all these projects that's available to you right now. And it is going to um, you know, give you a dashboard uh, where you can just see what are the services out there. So I'm going to go and hit on the services. There you go. So it will tell you um, that I have a front end, I have a back end. In my case, I even have a zipkin running because I have a tie.yaml, which I forgot to clear it. Uh, but that's okay. But we don't have time either. So um, the, so let me show you. If you do a tied run, what happens is like you know it just runs your services. Uh, but um, since I have this, uh, this is not the code. Since I have this YAML file, basically you just go and say tie in it, uh, and then it's going to create this YAML file. What I did is I went ahead and added one more thing called Zipkin, and Zipkin is a nice thing for distributed tracing, like tracing those things. Uh, so once you add this extension, what it does is basically it goes in and uh, adds the services front end, back end, and now you see Zipkin is not installed in my system, so it detects, all right, let me give you a container. So as long as your Docker is running, uh, it is just going to pull in the Docker um, um, container and it is going to host it for you. So now if you just go into this uh, thing, uh, so this is basically the same thing, weather forecast, uh, it just has a nice UI. So if you keep refreshing, it just refreshes all these things. Uh, it's connecting the back end. And because we have this beautiful code out here, it does the service discovery automatically. Apologies for that. I f should have just rolled back these things when I was testing this. Um, let me show you that quick code quickly. Startup. OK, this is the thing. So if you just go and say conf configuration.getservice URI, it is going to look up what is that name that you're given for your service backend. It will pull the port automatically. If you look at the dashboard, it basically gives you this uh, port, looks at your system, and automatically assigns this port. So you don't have to really worry about this port at all. Right? So 
You can also look at the view logs and that kind of things. Pretty good, pretty awesome. Uh, you should give it a try. So talking about Zipkin as well. So one quick thing. I only have two minutes. Um, just want to be sure. Um, going back to Zipkin. So since I enabled Zipkin, what it's, oops, 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 oops. Something is messed up. Let me see if I, okay. Okay, let me stop this. I don't know what exactly happened there, but uh, Doctor PS. So we can we have the Zipkin running? We're good with that. So this should actually work. I don't know why it's not working, but I don't have time to debug that either. So I'll just leave it for that for now. But I would encourage you to check the sample out here. So if you go to GitHub.com dot net slash thai um you you can see there are a lot of bunch of samples inside these docs uh, there are recipes uh, within recipes you have these recipes of how do you start with zipkin um, and over here you have this like you know what are the uh, yaml file configuration that is needed for it right okay uh, and if you are working, okay, this one, this is the markdown file. So this is the one which is the Zimkin. The important aspect is we, we support open API tracing, uh, open, sorry, open telemetry. So you need to enable this so that in the tracing is seen. So once it is running, you basically, what you're going to see is basically you're going to see this back end and front end. How is it, how much time it's taking? All those things are just with the one line of code. It's all enabled for you. All right.